And so the temple's rebuilt, okay? Then it says there's going to be 62 weeks, which takes you all the way up chronologically to about the time of Jesus' baptism, okay? Um, you read, if you read through Luke, the first few chapters, you'll see a couple different references with, I think, Simeon and Anna, where it makes references about how they were, they were looking for the Messiah. They were looking for him. Well, why were they looking for him, right? It's likely because they understood this prophecy, right? So we're going to read through. This is overview. So then you start this 70th week, okay? And it will tell you that the Messiah is cut off in the middle of the week. It talks about him confirming a covenant. And then after that, it talks about the prince will come and destroy the city in 70 A.D., okay? Um, in 70 A.D., we know that the Roman uh, general Titus, uh, his father, Vespasian, was the emperor. He came and destroyed Jerusalem, right? So that's really what the, the, the 70 weeks, the prophecy of Daniel's 70 weeks, is outlining. Um, it's so specific that this is one of the reasons, along with chapter 10, which we'll get into to today, it's so specific in the book of Daniel that what did the people that came along, came along later that deny inspiration? Somebody who lives today who denies inspiration, who would they say couldn't have written the book? Daniel. Say Daniel couldn't have written the book. Well, why not? Because he tells super specific details about future events hundreds of years in advance, right? So that's why people say, well, Daniel couldn't have written it. A lot of scholars will say, actually, Daniel didn't write it. A later person wrote it who was a historian because he'd have to be a historian to do what? To tell you all these things so specific and accurate, right? But we know that God is, knows the beginning from the end. He can see all things at once, right? He knows the future. That's one of the reasons it makes him God. How does he do it? He's God, right? How, do, how is there a being that's eternal that speaks the universe in existence? Anyone want to try to explain that one? Right? There are some things that the Bible just doesn't explain to us, right? It just says God is. He's eternal, right? So this is an overview, okay? Um, this is another image, uh, basically of 70 weeks. So the word to restore the city, Jerusalem rebuilt, 62 more weeks, up to the time the Messiah arrives and the Messiah is cut off. Now, you'll notice some people have different dates. Um, and then it talks about the end of the 70 weeks. This is supposed to be a picture of, I guess, Titus. I don't think anyone maybe knows what he looks like. There may be some um, busts of, of Titus somewhere. But this is a summary, right? Now, some of these dates are different because we uh, will look at Christ and say he's born in, you know, 0 A.D. Because A.D. means Anna Domina in the year of our Lord. But we find out later those dates were from a guy hundreds of years later who went back and tried to give you dates. So when you look at it, some people will say he was born in 4 B.C. because that's when Herod the Great died. And Scripture says Herod the Great was alive when Jesus was born, right? So really, you just have, you know, three or four dates different. Uh, it doesn't change the timeline. It just depends on which date you choose to use. It's still 490 years. And this is the third one. Now, this is from a guy uh, that's a member of the church. And um, he actually reads Daniel 7 or Daniel 9 from the LXX, which is the Septuagint. Uh, it's the Greek translation, about 250 years before Jesus, uh, of the Hebrew Old Testament, all right? And um, Codex Vaticanus, which is about, written about 300 years after Jesus, it, those two manuscripts uh, have a textual variant, which means they say the Messiah is cut off at the end of the 70th week. So that's why if you look into this more, or you find this chart and you see those differences, that's the difference. But you can see the, the whole gist is what? Seven weeks from the time this decree goes out to rebuild Jerusalem, 49 years. Then from the time that it's built, 62 weeks leads all the way up to, you can see it's not to scale, to the time the Messianic window opens, till the Messiah comes onto the scene. That's what starts the 70th, the last week. And then you've got this Messianic window of seven years. Christ is cut off uh, at the end of the 70th week, according to him, right? If you want to talk more about which manuscripts are more reliable, we can talk more about that later. But, um, so let's go back. I'm going to go back to the first one because I, I like personally like this one, okay? Now let's go to Daniel 9.27 and read through it slowly. So Daniel 9, let's start in verse, um, verse 21. While I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, okay, we said Gabriel brought him the message, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, cause, being caused to fly swiftly, reached me about the time of the evening offering. I think the evening offering is maybe 3 or 4 p.m. Um, so maybe 3 or 4 p.m., Daniel's been praying, and Gabriel comes to him. And he says in verse 22, He informed me and talked with me, saying, O Daniel, I have now come forth to give you skill to understand. At the beginning of your supplications, your prayers, the command went out, and I have come to tell you, for you are greatly beloved." 
Therefore, consider the matter and understand the vision. Seventy weeks are determined for your people. Who is the people that Daniel's a part of at this time? The Jewish nation, that's right. And your holy city, which is what? Jerusalem, right? To finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness. Now, what person that we read about in the New Testament fulfilled all those things? Jesus did. If you read Isaiah 53 or many of the New Testament texts, you'll see this idea that Jesus finished sin. He basically took away the power of sin that had been introduced in the garden, right? To make an end of sins, right? That doesn't mean that people today don't sin, but it means that Jesus took care of it. He made a cure for it, right? To make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness. Romans 1, 16 and 17 and chapter 3 talk about how the gospel is God's power to save, and the gospel makes people what? Righteous, right? Through Christ. You know what I'm saying. It doesn't make, I'm not perfect, right? Okay. The next part of Daniel 9, 24 says, To seal up vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Okay? To seal up vision and prophecy, right? Um, what did Jesus say after his resurrection? He had basically all things that were written of him were what? Fulfilled, right? All the things in the Old Testament looking forward to the Messiah, Jesus fulfilled those things talking about him uh, at the cross. When you look at Hebrews 1, it talks about how God spoke to people in many different ways and different manners in the past, but now speaks to us through who? Through his son, Jesus Christ, right? Hebrews 1, 1 and 2, okay? To anoint the most holy. Um, there's some, I guess, disagreement about whether the Hebrew means uh, a holy place or whether it means a holy person, right? Obviously, I think if you look at the context, what does it look like? A person, right? That's who's going to put an end to transgression, Okay. So to anoint the most holy, Christ, some people would say this is referring to Christ's baptism, okay, the, when he was anointed. Verse 25, know therefore and understand from the going forth of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, okay, until Messiah the Prince, his anointing, is going to be, what's it say? I lost my place, that's why I said that. I said, what's it say? I lost my place. Will be cut, okay, here we go. From the, to uh, rebuild and restore Jerusalem till Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks, okay, to restore and rebuild the temple, and 62 weeks, right? This period here, you see 62 weeks, all right? The street shall be built again and the wall, even in troublesome times. This is the street shall be built again, the wall, even in troublesome times. Go read Ezra and Nehemiah. Read about what happened. Read about how they had to, one man, they're rebuilding the temple with what? Their weapons on right? Because people were trying to oppose them rebuilding the temple, okay? After the 62 weeks, after the 62 weeks in this period, what's going to happen? The Messiah will be cut off, right? Christ cut off, right? Cut off in the middle of his life. Uh, ironically, uh, seven was the Jewish uh, number for completeness, and Jesus' ministry was likely how long? About three and a half years. Uh, throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, this idea of three and a half means it's incomplete, right? Meaning that not that Jesus' work was incomplete, but that they killed him basically in the prime of his life, right? So three and a half years. You'll see that in Old Testament and New Testament prophetic literature when you see a time, times, and half a time, three and a half. 1,280 days, that's three and a half years, right? You'll see that quite a bit. Or uh, 42 months, which is how many years? Three and a half. If we do Revelation next quarter, then you'll see, you'll see that. Um, and if you think these prophecies are confusing, just wait till we study Revelation, okay? Uh, but we're going to tackle it, all right? And I'm going to tell you what every single, sing, every single symbol means. <laughs> Dwayne, he got it. He started laughing. No, don't worry. I'm not going to say this is what this means, and if you don't like it, you can get out. That's not going to happen. We're going to say this is an Old Testament picture. It's what it looks like in the New Testament, okay? Uh, after the 62 weeks, the Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. Why was Christ cut off? Why did he have to go to the cross? For us. That's right. And now the people of the prince who is to come, it happens after the Messiah is cut off, is going to be who? He's going to destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with a flood. Titus is the Roman general that came. Right Now some people will say, now wait a minute, Aaron. That didn't happen three and a half years later. That happened in 70 AD, 40 years later, right? It did say in the text that desolations are determined, right? When did Jesus say, hey, this is going to happen? Did he say it during his life? Yeah, I would say, hey, in Matthew 24, 
He said this is going to happen. He determined that. Now, in a sense, God knew it was going to happen because of his foreknowledge. But Jesus actually told the people, hey, in 40 years, Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. Right? That's in Matthew 24 and some other texts. Okay. The people of the prince who is to come, uh, midway through verse 26, shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with the flood. Until the end of the uh, war, desolations are determined. So they're determined by God. Okay. Verse 27, then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week, but in the middle of the week he shall bring a sacrifice and offering. Okay, now different people disagree about, okay, is this now referencing back to Christ or is this still talking about Titus, right? There's good commentators that argue about this. I'm not going to get in the middle and try to argue with them. Um, but to me, it seems like in the middle of the week he will confirm a covenant with many. Who, who would we say confirmed a covenant Christ. I mean, personally, right now, that's who I take this. As. I take it as referring back to Jesus, right? Confirmed a covenant with many for one week. In the middle of the week, he will bring an end to sacrifice and offering, okay? Now, Christ brought an end to the Old Testament law of Moses, sacrifice and offering by his once-for-all sacrifice, right? Some people will say that think this is referring to Titus, that, hey, Titus is the one that brought an end to sacrifice and offering because when he destroyed the temple, guess what you're not doing there anymore? You're not offering anymore once he destroys the temple, right? Okay. And on the wing of abomination shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. And I think that that passage is referencing, once again, back to AD 70. Uh, the wings of abomination, the temple is left desolate, okay? Um, somebody would say, well, why does it go Christ, Titus, Christ, Titus? In my, uh, if you look earlier in the text, uh, back in verse... 24, it says, 70 weeks for your people to finish. No, it's not 24. Look at 25, maybe. Okay, the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem, Messiah the Prince. So it says, Jerusalem, Christ. And then it says, seven weeks, Jerusalem, 62 weeks, Christ. And then it goes back to, the street will be built again in troublesome times, Jerusalem. And then it talks about the end of the 60 weeks, Messiah, Christ. So I think the text pretty frequently goes... Talks about this, this, bounces back, and goes back and forth, sort of making parallels, right? Um, so that's the end of chapter 9, all right? I feel more comfortable explaining it that way than the end of last week. I'll be honest with you, at the end of last week, I just felt, the, whole, the rest of the day, I thought, man, I did not. I think I left people more confused than I started, which is like the opposite of what you want to do as a teacher, right? So, um, so hopefully that makes Daniel 9, 27, uh, and, or the earlier end of chapter 9, 24 through 27, make a little bit more sense than we left it last week. Okay. So let's go ahead and move into Daniel chapter, uh, Daniel chapter 10. Uh, I say this uh, every week. Uh, I have a list in the back on the table on the right uh, that if you write your email address down, I'll add you to a group. And each week, like tomorrow or Tuesday, I'll update, add my chapter 10 notes to a Word document, and then I'll email that out. Uh, and also these videos of all the classes uh, are on my YouTube page. So I'll add this one in the next few days. So you can go on there and watch it again if you really want to, if you're a glutton for punishment, okay? Um, so let's start in chapter 10, okay? Chapter 10 and verse 1 gives us the time stamp, okay? In the third year of Cyrus, the king of Persia, a message was revealed to Daniel whose name was Belteshazzar, okay? That's the name that they gave him when they brought him as a teenager into Babylon, okay? The message was true, but the appointed time was long, and he understood the message and, ha and had understanding of the vision. Now, uh, the message was true, but the appointed time was long. Does anybody's translation have something different? Yes. A great conflict, okay? Um, I don't know Hebrew, uh, believe it or not. So um, there's different people that interpret it different ways, okay? For instance, uh, let me open up a comparison. Uh, the New King James says the appointed time was long. That's normally what I, what I teach from. Um, the ESV says it was a great conflict. The King James says the appointed time was long. The NIV says it concerned a great war. And the ASV says even a great warfare. So, you know, even in the, the ASV, the New King James, you have this different idea, right, of it was a long time or it was a great warfare. Um, which one do you like? I don't really think it makes that big of a, di a difference when you look into the context of the chapter, okay? But there are some different ones if you're curious about why your translation is, is different, okay? So this is probably about 536 B.C. I have it in the notes. You don't have to remember that. And this is the Cyrus that was prophesied about in uh, Isaiah. 
Um, Isaiah 44, 28 prophesied about this man Cyrus when? Before he was even born, right? Okay, so God prophesied his, uh, his rise. Look at Daniel chapter 10 and verse 2. In those days I, Daniel, was mourning for three full weeks. That's a long time to mourn, isn't it? You know, uh, if I'm honest, I look at some of these guys and how spiritual they are sometimes, and it makes me think, what's wrong with me? I mean, I've never mourned for three full weeks, right? And you have him here where, why is he mourning for three full weeks? What are some thoughts? What are some possibilities? Think about what he just saw. Yeah, I mean, he just saw in this last chapter this vision about, you know, the, the temple being rebuilt, but then talk about desolations and the Messiah who you're waiting for, the anointed one's going to be cut off. Now, how much did Daniel understand? I'm not really sure at that time. Um, but a lot of these visions were terrifying to him, right? And so this one talks about his people and abominations, desolations, and, and ending sacrifice and offering. And so he's, you know, probably thinking, well, that's not what I'm hoping for. I'm hoping for the reinstitution of it because he's in captivity in Babylon, right? So it seems that he's, uh, you know, he's mourning for three full weeks. And um, it seems from, if you look at the dates about this time, the temple foundation may have been already built by those, some people that were sent back, but um, you don't really know exactly what the situation, exactly the time frame. Sometimes when you go back, what, 2,500 years, it's a little hard to tell which is occurring in what month, all right? So look at verse 3. I ate no pleasant food, no meat or wine came into my mouth, nor did I anoint myself at all till three whole weeks were fulfilled, right? So he doesn't eat any pleasant food. He's not having any meat nor wine. Now, I think most of you probably understand this, but in the Bible, how's the word wine used? Generically, context always determines it, right? In Ephesians 5, 18 and 19, okay, this is the New Testament in Greek, the word oinos is used, and it says, be not drunk with wine. What's the context tell you? That's obviously what? Alcoholic. But if you look in uh, some of the passages in Isaiah, it talks about wine, and then the Greek translation of the Old Testament, it says oinos, wine, in the cluster. That's in a grape, right? So in the grape, is that alcoholic? No, okay? Evelyn has grapes every morning, right? I don't think I'm being a bad parent, okay? So that's not what it's saying. So you have to always look at context to see how a word is used, okay? So we see wine, and in our culture, wine is always what? Alcoholic, right? Yeah, so you have to determine context. This is probably not referencing alcoholic wine, all right? I don't think it is. I ate no pleasant food, meat, or wine came into my mouth, nor did I anoint myself at all till three whole weeks for, were fulfilled. If you go back and look, there's a lot of writings, especially even in the Old Testament, that talk about this is obviously uh, seems to be a dry climate type area. Uh, and even in the Old Testament, um, it seems like uh, India and Persia, that area, they would always anoint themselves with lotions. Uh, this is a quote from Jerome, all right? Uh, Jerome, who's not an inspired writer, is uh, about 4th century uh, A.D., he said in India and Persia, lotion had replaced daily baths, right? So how lucky are you that you don't live over there, right? I, I think about this a lot. Think about how lucky we are as a people to live in the time that we live in, right? Now, yes, a lot of times these pleasures can basically uh, distract us from what's truly important. But how many times did a Roman emperor, one of the Caesars, take a super nice hot water heater shower every morning? I mean, maybe they had slaves that heated up giant pots of water and sprinkled it. I don't know. But what I'm saying is the things that we have, we're pretty lucky as far as this time in history. I mean, ice makers, when I go to Africa, you know what I don't get for about three four weeks? Ice, right? And if they have ice, you normally don't want it because it's made with the local water and it'll make you super sick, right? So you just think about the idea that we have it really good in our, in our time. So uh, he's not um, putting any lotion on him. He's not anointing himself with oil. In the notes, I have lots of Old Testament passages that you can reference. Um, 2 Samuel 12.20, uh, it says this. So David arose from the ground. This is after his child died. That's the context. He arose from the ground, washed and anointed himself, and changed his clothes. Right. So when he was fasting and mourning and praying for his seven-day-old child to be saved, uh, he, did, he did what Daniel did. Uh, he didn't eat food. He didn't anoint himself with oil, uh, anything like that. All right, let's go to Daniel chapter 10 and verse 4. Now, on the 24th day, the first of the month, as I was by the side of the great river, that is the Tigris River, verse 5, I lifted my eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose waist was girded with gold of Euphaz. Right now, um, it seems that this is like priestly dress, right? Um, uh, a man clothed in linen, his waist was girded with gold. 
Um, in Exodus 28, you had the priests. They were supposed to wear linen trousers to cover their nakedness. They reached from, reach from the waist to the thighs. Okay? And in uh, Leviticus 6.10, the priest shall put on his linen garment, his linen trousers on his body, take up the ashes of the burnt offering, etc. Talking about the altar. In Leviticus 16.4, he shall put the holy linen tunic and the linen trousers on his body. He shall be girded with a linen sash, okay, belt, and with the linen turban he shall be attired. These are the holy garments, right? So this is what the priest, so this kind of depiction here is some sort of priestly individual in Daniel 10.5. All right, look at Daniel 10.6. His body was like beryl. Who knows what beryl is? All right, this is stone, precious stone, yeah. Yellow sapphire is what the resources that I have said. And his face, this is referencing that, that person with the priestly garments, his face was like the appearance of lightning, his eyes like torches of fire, his arms and feet like burnished bronze in color, and the sound of his words were like the voice of a multitude, right? Um, literal or figurative, obviously. It's figurative language, but when he sees him, that's what he sees this. He's trying to describe what this person looks like, right? It's a, it's a magnificent vision. Um, who is the man, okay? Um, some people say, well, maybe it's Gabriel, because he's been talked about frequently in chapter 9, and later in chapter 10, there's going to be Gabriel who talks about being withstood by the prince of Persia, all right? What is that talking about? Um, some people will say, well, this, has to, this can't be anybody else. Well, they'll say it can't be Christ, pre-incarnate Christ, because the prince of Persia withstands him, and obviously, if it's the pre-incarnate Christ, he's what? Going to have no problem with whoever the prince of Persia is, right? Unless... As we read through this, you see two different people in this chapter. Uh, right now, I see two different people. I see the person that Daniel sees first, and then I see the person that delivers this second message. So it also could possibly be um, maybe the pre-incarnate Christ. Here's my reasoning for that, right? Um, let's see. Leave. Can you go back to Daniel 10.5? Let's see. Uh, okay, no. Go to Daniel 10.6. So just remember Daniel 10.5 in your minds, okay? It says he's dressed with his linen sash, with a, bait, uh, a, a belt around his waist, right? Leave Daniel 10.6 up there, and just pay attention to that while I read Revelation 1, 13, 15. Now, when we study Revelation, we're going to constantly be saying, hey, guess what? When the New Testament Christians saw this, and they knew the Old Testament, they'd be able to say, oh, wow, that's just like in Daniel, right? So listen to Revelation 1, 13 through 15. I'm going to read it, but you stay, stay on Daniel 10.6. In the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to his feet, and girded about the chest with a golden band. His head and hair were white like wool, and white as snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a fine furnace, and his voice as if the sound of many waters. Right? Do you see a parallel between Daniel 10.6? I mean, it's almost like an identical description, right? In Revelation 2.18 and to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things says the Son of God, who had eyes like flames of fire and his feet like fine brass. Right? So, is Daniel seeing a picture of the pre-incarnate Christ? Is that who he's seeing in this vision? Maybe. Maybe. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know in, um, in Ezekiel, there, uh, I think, I can't remember the chapter, maybe 9 or 10, um, I think there may be where there are four people referenced as having linen garments with a, I mean, I'm not sure though, I know there's some men in linen described in Ezekiel, but I'm not going to make a statement as to who I think that is right now because I haven't looked at my notes. Sure, sure, sure. So, yeah, I mean, is, is it possible? Uh, I think right now, I guess, I'm sort of leaning towards a position as the pre-incarnate Christ that he's given this vision of, okay? Um, look at verse 7. And Daniel, I alone, saw the vision, for the men who were with me did not see the vision, but a great terror fell upon them, so that they fled to hide themselves. Therefore, I was left alone when I saw this great vision, and no strength remained in me, for my vigor was turned to frailty, and I retained no strength. Yet I heard the sound of his words, and while I heard the sound of his words, I was in a deep sleep on my face with my face to the ground. In Revelation 1.17, when John had his vision, this is what he said. When I saw him, speaking of who? In Revelation. For sure it's the Son of God. It's Christ there, okay? I fell at his feet as if I was dead. 
But he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid, I am the first and the last. Right? So you see a parallel between these visions that Daniel has and John has in Revelation. And they both have the exact same effect. Right? Which is, they what? Fall down in terror and in dread. Now, was the apostle John and Daniel, were they holy men? Absolutely they were, right? I mean, obviously the Apostle John had his shortcomings, right? But at the same time, you've got Daniel, who's been faithful in a pagan nation since the time he's 15. They probably made him a eunuch. I mean, can you imagine a teenager taken into a foreign nation and that having that done to him, and he's supposed to serve the ruler of the world and never sort of wavering in his faith, right? Even surrounded by all these people. I mean, him and his friends, you know, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were, were faithful guys. That's an understatement, right? And so... Daniel, who's super faithful and godly, and God sends an angel to talk to him, when he sees this vision of who I think right now, at least, uh, I've changed my mind on things before, it'll probably happen again, but when he sees this vision, he falls as if he's dead, and he's terrified, right? That's something to remember a lot of times when I hear people say, oh yeah, Jesus appeared to me in a dream, in a vision, and he was just, hey, what's up, you know? I mean, there's a time and a place to argue with people about that, but when people in scripture saw it, godly men, what were they? They were terrified. Scott and I have talked about Isaiah 6, when Isaiah, who uh, is a righteous man, sees this vision of what John 12 tells us is the Messiah. He says, I'm a man of unclean lips, right? When people saw the pre-incarnate Christ, most accounts, they were terrified. In the Old Testament, um, Samson's parents, they, after the pre-incarnate Christ appeared to them, they said what? Well, we're going to die because you can't see God and live, right? So um, that's who is possible that, that is appearing to Daniel. Okay, now... Verse 10, suddenly a hand touched me, which made me tremble on my hands and knees and on the palm of my hands. That's what happened to John in Revelation, right? Now, who is this that's touched him on the shoulder and strengthened him and raised him? Let's go ahead and keep reading in Daniel 10, 11. He said to me, O Daniel, man greatly beloved, understand the words which I speak to you and stand upright, for I have now been sent to you. While he was speaking this word to me, I stood trembling, all right? So he's terrified, whoever this is talking to him. Now, this is where I said some people say this is one person throughout the whole text. If it's one person, then it's likely not the pre-incarnate Christ. I don't think what's going to happen after this is something Christ would have to say, right? Someone that God would have to say, okay? Now, if it's, uh, if it's two people, which I kind of feel like it is, because that description is just like exactly how Revelation describes him, then it may have switched people. Who is the person that strengthens him? It may be this person here, okay? I'll let you be the judge of that for yourself. Verse 12. Then he said to me, do not fear, Daniel, for from the first day you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before God, your words were heard, and I've come because of your words. So he says, hey, since you started praying and likely fasting, which was how long ago according to the very beginning of the chapter? Three weeks, okay? So for the last 21 days, he's been humbling himself, fasting, and praying, okay? And he says, I've come because of your words. God heard you, okay? Verse 13. Now, this is where it starts to get a little bit interesting, okay? I'll be honest with you. You may be surprised um, what some of the people that um, some people believe about this. Uh, I'm gonna, we're going to read it. I'm going to tell you what I think it means. Um, you're free to disagree, okay? But I will say this. We've got to be very careful about even what we determine what this text means about taking it too far, okay? There's a lot of people that took this text, I think, too far, uh, and you even see that today in books that are written and that sort of thing. And we'll talk about that at the end of the chapter. All right, but let's, let's look at this. Verse 13, but the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me for how, how long? 21 days. And behold, Michael, one of the chief princes. All right, what do you think chief princes mean? It's, I think it's referring to a class of angels. We're told Michael was what kind of an angel? An archangel, okay? So I think it's referring to Michael, okay? But Michael, one of the chief princes, one of the archangels, okay? Michael's the only archangel that we're told about in Scripture, right? We're not given a name uh, for, for another one, okay? Now, there's some Jewish apocalyptic non-inspired writing that tries to give names of other ones, but Scripture doesn't tell us that, right? Okay. One of the chief princes came to help me, for I'd been left there alone with the kings of Persia, all right? What's it sound like on the surface? You've got what? Let's say it's an angel, and what does it seem to be saying? He said somebody withstood him for 21 days. Who's going to withstand an angel? An angel, right? I mean, you think that an a I'm, a, I'm a, if I was, let's say I'm Alexander the Great, you think an angel's concerned about me fighting with him? No, of course not, right? Angels killed 185,000 people 
with, from the army of Assyria in one night, right? So angels are way more powerful than humans are, okay? Yet you have here, the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. Now, here's the different interpretations. Some people think that what this text is talking about is just apocalyptic language. It's using the same type of language to talk about um, the way that God providentially works, but this is not saying angels are fighting each other in the spiritual realm and we can't see it, right? Some people, including a lot of the uh, commentators in the, in, the, in the brotherhood, think that, hey, this might be a window into a, a realm that God doesn't let us look into very often, right? In the book of Job, what are we? We're given a window into this realm of what? God and Satan saying, hey, uh, John, uh, God, have you considered my servant Job? Well, yeah, he only loves you because, you know, you, he has this great life. Oh, well, give me permission to, to basically afflict him. You can have that permission. And Satan goes out and afflicts Job, right? That's a window that we're given into Scripture we don't see very often, right? In Ephesians 6, it says we don't wrestle with flesh and blood, but with what? Principalities, powers, in the heavenlies. That's what the, the, the Greek says, heavenlies, but translates heavenly places, right? These powers of darkness. What does that mean? Paul doesn't give us that much information, does he? Right? I wonder if God doesn't give us that much information because he doesn't want us to be more concerned with that than the things we ought to be concerned with, which is the things in our own realm, okay? But uh, it seems like since he started praying 21 days ago, seems like this angel's been what? In some sort of dispute with whoever the prince of Persia is, okay? Um, let's see. I'm trying to look through my notes, see if I want to bring... Yeah, it goes back to verse 12, because he says, in verse 12, he says, For the first day you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself. Since 21 days ago, your words were heard, and I have come, right? But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. It's almost like he's saying, hey, I started to make my way to you 21 days ago when you started fasting and praying, but somebody held me up. I've had some work that I've been trying to basically work on. And then it says, it withstood him 21 days until, behold, what? Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I'd been left there alone with the kings of Persia. This leads some people to say, hey, look, does God put angels over nations? Uh, look at Daniel 12.1, if you have your Bible. We'll cover this two weeks from now. Daniel 12.1, at this time, Michael shall stand up. Michael's what? An archangel. The great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. What's that sound like? Sounds like an angel, Michael, is watching over the nation of Israel, right? And in the Old Testament, if uh, Israel is God's chosen people, it makes sense he'd have Michael, the archangel, watching over him, right? Um, some people take this a little too far, in my opinion. I mean, it's my opinion. You can take it or leave it. Um, and you, what you'll see in history, and we'll talk a little bit more about this, is after, you know, you have Daniel, and he's telling about all these things that are going to happen between the Old Testament and the New Testament, you have something historically called the Second Temple Period, which is after the temple is rebuilt and that time between Malachi and the New Testament, you have all kinds of this, these um, angelology is the fancy word, the doctrine, the teaching about angels. You have all kinds of uninspired writings that say all sorts of things about angels. Basically, I could see how somebody back then reads about this text in Daniel and then does what? Goes a little too far. They start saying, well, maybe this happens, and they write it down, and before you know it, you got people in 2021 reading some uninspired book and saying, hey, this, is, this, this was left out of the Bible. This should be, this is God's word, right? And this is what happens with angels, right? Um, I'm not going to go that far. I'm going to say, I'll tell you what Daniel says. You can be the judge for yourself. But I'm going to say, when you get into this topic, be careful about going and reading all these, you know, uh, apocryphal literature and starting to think that that's as inspired as the, the Bible because it's not. Yeah, that's right. Scripture, that's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Revelation 12, 7, the footnote your Bible has is talking about how uh, the angels in heaven and Satan had this battle and Satan was cast down. Um, in Revelation, it uses a lot of figurative language. It uses a lot of events that have already happened um, to basically say, hey, like that's happening then, this is happening now. Uh, is that in Revelation figurative language to say, hey, God's forces at some point? I mean, there's a lot of things we just don't know. So, I mean, for instance, 2 Peter and Jude tell us that the angels sinned and they were what? Cast down. Is Revelation 12 sort of giving a picture into something that happened previously? Maybe. Is God just saying, hey, Satan and his evil forces are fighting against God's forces? 
which is technically what the book of Revelation is about, the evil nation of Rome persecuting God's people. And the book of Revelation is figurative language, right? And so however you interpret Revelation 12, that's sort of the idea that you have here in Daniel. Is this saying there's a literal angel or is it apocalyptic language? Um, I don't know. It seems to me like it, if I'm honest with you, it seems to me like it's saying there's what? There's angels. There's something going on that we don't know about, right? It's pretty fascinating. The first time I read through Daniel, I was like, what? I called uh, Mike Reese, who's a preacher, that I went, I said, have you read this before? He's like, yeah, I've read it before, you know? I was just like fascinated, okay? All right, so let's keep moving. But the prince of Persia withstood me 21 days, and behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. I'd been left alone with the kings of Persia. Uh, Daniel 10, 14. Now I've come to make you understand what will happen to your people, which is who? The Jews in the latter days, okay? A lot of times people will take that phrase to mean the end of the world. That's where a lot of premillennialists get their idea. A lot of times you have in the Old Testament the former prophets are the ones before Babylon, and like Zechariah calls himself a latter prophet. Isaiah 2, Jeremiah 2, I'll tell you what happened in the last days. All right, Hebrews 1.1, 1, 1, uh, the last days he's spoken to us. Um, the Christian age is sometimes thought of the last days, and that's probably, that's probably right. But it's also right, I think, when you look at the Old Testament to assume the last days is the, the idea of this, the end of the Jewish empire, right? The last days of the Jewish people, what's going to happen? Isaiah 2, Jeremiah 2, there's going to be a fountain for cleansing. Uh, Joel 2 and Acts 2, when the gospel comes, is the ending of the Old Testament covenant, right? So that's what it's talking about when it says the latter days. The vision refers for many days to come. Daniel 10, 15. When he had spoken such words to me, I turned my face towards the ground and become speechless. And suddenly one having the likeness of the sons of men touched my lips. Then I opened my mouth and spoke, saying to him who stood before me, My Lord, because of the vision, sorrows have overwhelmed me and I have retained no strength. For how can this servant of my Lord talk with you? As for me, no strength remains in me now, nor is any breath left in me. Then again, the one having the likeness of a man touched me and strengthened me. And he said, O man, greatly beloved, fear not. Peace be to you. Be strong. Yes, be strong. So when he spoke to me, I was strengthened and said, Let my Lord speak, for you've strengthened me. Then he said, Do you know why I have come to you? And now I must return and fight with the prince of Persia. And when I've gone forth, indeed, the prince of who? Greece will come. It seems like he's saying, hey, I've got to go take care of Persia in possibly the spiritual way. But then after that, Greece is going to come, and I'm going to have to deal with him. Verse 21. But I will tell you what is noted in the scripture of truth. No one upholds me against these except Michael, your prince. That's just like Rev, uh, Daniel 12.1, where he says, the prince that stands watch over your people. So it seems like this, I believe an angel, is saying, hey, I had to go fight with these angels that are somehow providentially involved with the work of Persia. Then it's going to happen with Greece, but the only one that helps me fight, stand up against him is Michael, this archangel, right? Now, does that mean it's not dependent on us? Of course not. Throughout the Old Testament, the way you live determines what God, how God deals with you. Okay. Verse, well, that's the end of the chapter. All right. I have so many notes. Now, quickly, let me say this. Um, I talked about how later people started elaborating on this doctrine, and, and I would say, in my opinion, which is just mine, take it for what it's worth, went a little too far. And you have a lot of these uninspired scriptures like Third Enoch, all right? This is what Third Enoch in chapter 26 says, why is their name called seraphim? Because they burn the tablets of Satan. Seraphim means burning ones. That's what it means in Hebrew. Every day Satan sits with Samael, prince of Rome, and Dubael, prince of Persia, and they write down the sins of Israel on tablets and give them to the seraphim, to bring them before the Holy One, blessed be he, so he should destroy Israel. So what they would say is they took a text like this, and I don't know where the other resources are they got, probably tradition, and they basically would say, hey, that there are these evil angels, and they give them names that Scripture doesn't give them, and they go and write down all the sins of Israel, and they hold it up to God and say, hey, they're evil, you ought to destroy them, right? So be careful if you start to dive down this that you don't go down the rabbit hole and get led into something that's not Scripture, okay? So stick with what Daniel teaches. Um, I'm fine with saying that what Daniel teaches is right because it's Scripture, right? But just be careful that we don't launch off into some other stuff, and um, you can go down some rabbit holes with this stuff. So um, Next week, we're going to dive into uh, chapter 11. And uh, chapter 11 is, um, some people have called it um, the most predictive chapter in the entire Old Testament. Uh, one writer said 130 predictions are made in the first 35 verses and it's the most specific chapter in the entire Old Testament. It's going to continue to trace this 
te- this history of wor- world history before it happens, from Greece all the way down through the Egyptian reign of the Ptolemies and the Syrian reign of the Seleucids, all the way down through uh, and leading up to the time of Rome coming into the picture, uh, leading up to the time of Christ. So you can see throughout the book of Daniel, Daniel is given, because he's so faithful, he's given this vision, uh, all these visions throughout the whole chapter of, hey, Babylon to Medo-Persia to Greece to the division of that into four kingdoms and how they interact, all leading up to the time um, of Christ coming, the Messiah. So we'll tackle that next uh, next week. Sign-up sheet in the back. If you've already signed up, you're going to keep continue getting the notes. You're in a group. If you haven't signed up yet, uh, add your email back there. If you have any other questions, too, uh, feel free to email me or find me and ask me um, what I think, and you take it or reject it, all right? So, all right, thanks for your attention.